Um, hello, and thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, I'm Gordon from Cambridge, and today I'm going to talk about the cosmological bootstrap. In particular, I'm going to talk about how to constrain correlators using the following two principles. The first is a unitarity, and the result is something we call the cosmological optical theorem. The second is uh, locality, and we can, use, uh, we can get something called the manifest lo uh, lo uh, locality test. So let's start by talking about unitarity. So in quantum mechanics, uh, states at different times are related by a time efficient operator. So for example, here, a state at time t is related to a state at time t naught by this operator u here. And unitarity just tells you that u dagger u must be equal to one. More broadly speaking, uh, it tells you that the norm of the state is conserved under time efficient. And this whole thing is what gives you the whole uh, probability, uh, probability in interpretation when you overlap different states. Now, it may seem very strange that we are using uh, unitary time efficient as a constraint because uh, none of us is uh, living here, right? In the inflationary space time, we are all, we, all we see is uh, things that live here in the, uh, at the end of the inflation, right? But it turns out that demanding unitary time efficient does actually uh, leave, uh, uh, actually give you constraint on these correlators in the following way. So suppose you have, uh, you describe inflation by some sort of field theory, and then you specify uh, the Hamiltonian of the theory. Now you can write, then write down the time efficient operator, essentially u is equal to e to the power i h t. And then you remember that u decker u is equal to one, this is the constraint we want. So you write down, you, uh, you go to perturbation theory and expand u, equal to one plus delta u. And these delta u are just written in terms of these, uh, uh, the, uh, these uh, iteration Hamiltonian. You just put it into here. And what you get is a uh, delta u plus delta u dagger equals to minus delta u delta u dagger. So on the left-hand side here, it's just linear in terms of delta u, but on the right side, it's quadratic. So this is a nonlinear relation and it tells, uh, and it gives you, uh, it relates different order in perturbation theory together. So more on the more practical level, what you do is uh, you sandwich this equation with uh, these are operated, uh, these delta u are expressed in terms of interaction Hamiltonian, right? So they're operators, you sandwich them in terms of uh, with different states. And this spits out the um, wave function coefficients. If you have seen Harry's talk, if you haven't, uh, if you haven't seen his talk, uh, so you can just think of them as like endpoint correlators. On the left side, it spits out something like this, psi n plus psi n star. And on the right side, schematically, you get a product of wave functions and then some combination of them. And we want to express this uh, sort of relation in a more compact manner. And to do so, I'll need to introduce something we call the discontinuity. So suppose you have a function that depends on um, n external momenta here. And, and here, these uh, k's are in fact uh, the norm of the external momentum. So for example, here, K1 is equal to the norm of uh, X, uh, K1, so on and so forth. The discontinuity is defined as the uh, function itself minus this complex conjugate. And you also have to uh, change some of the arguments, some of the arguments to minus K star. So which one do you change? You take a look at this list here. So uh, if, uh, if you don't see the K here, you must uh, flip it and then give you a comment uh, and then change it to comments conjugate. So let me give you a very simple example. So let's say you have this K1, F K1, K2. This is equal to the function itself, K1, K2, minus this complex conjugate, right? Now you see here, in this list that's K1. So you don't change it. Just write down K1, good. You don't see K2 here. So you must change it to minus K2 star. So this is what this continuity, uh, this is what we define as this continuity. Now the discontinuity of a wave function coefficient can be expressed in terms of the products of uh, discontinuity of simpler wave functions. And um, sounds like, uh, it sounds a like mouthful, but uh, if we go to, uh, if we look at the Feynman diagrams, we will have a much, uh, much easier way, uh, uh, much easier time to understand this. So for example, here, you have a exchange diagram for a wave function coefficient. There are like N plus M external legs here, and you have like one internal line with a uh, momentum S, 
So you write down, this is psi n plus m, right? And you want to look at this discontinuity flipping S. So what this discontinuity operator does is in fact, it just cut open this uh, line and then you just push it to the boundary. So this becomes uh, two separate graphs, right? So on, on the left side, you get a graph with an n plus one because you have this extra leg here. It becomes a n plus one wave uh, a, a diagram of n plus one external legs. So this is in fact psi n plus one. This has a m external leg here and then x one external leg. So this is psi m plus one. So the cutting rules or uh, the cosmological optical theorem or what we call the cutting rule tells you that this psi n plus m is related to this psi n plus one, this psi m plus one. This is the, this is the, uh, so as this is what I expressed ex earlier. This of a wave function is expressed as a product of simpler, uh, of the uh, product of this of simpler wave functions coefficients. Now this relation is surprisingly general in the sense that it holds for particles of any mass. It holds for particles with any integer spin. And it also works for any flat FLW space time that admits a bunch Davis vacuum. And by bunch Davis vacuum, uh, I mean that the mode function of, a, of your theory can, uh, at the far pass, can be expressed uh, in terms of a plane wave divided by a scale factor. And as long as you are allowed to do that, uh, you, uh, you can write the way a mode function this, uh, in this form in the far pass then it doesn't matter if uh, uh, and then you can just uh, directly use these uh, cutting rules. It's surprisingly general. Now, for more complicated, uh, more complicated graphs involving loops, you can also do a, um, uh, you can also have a, uh, you have a cutting rule. And um, the way, uh, the way, uh, the way it's expressed is as follows. So the disk of this, uh, uh, this graph here, what, uh, you want to find this here, and what you do is uh, you write down all the ways you can cut the, uh, cut the internal lines of this diagram. So here you cut one line, these three graphs. Here in these three graphs, you cut two lines, right? And here you cut all three lines. And you do the same procedure, right? You, once you cut this, you just push these two lines to the boundary. So this becomes this graph. You do it for all the graphs. And the disk of this, uh, uh, the disk of this graph is equal to the sum of the disk of all these graphs here. Now, notice that this is a loop level, uh, this is a loop diagram, right? Now, except for this diagram, which is uh, unfortunately still has a loop, every di other diagram is a three level diagram. And it, uh, calculating loops in inflation is particularly nasty. And so this actually gives us a rather good way to compute, uh, uh, to, uh, to learn more about loops in inflation. So for example, if you want to look at the loop level correction to a, uh, to, uh, to a propagator here, you can, you can do the following. So you want to, uh, instead of calculating the whole disk, uh, whole graph, which is complicated, you look at the disk of this graph. And so you can imagine, for example, you cut just one line here. Let's say you cut this. What you get is the following graph. You just cut this, they had, uh, these two vertices are still connected by this line here. So, uh, uh, so you get this graph. And then you can also cut the second line, which will give you this graph. They're all three level diagrams, so they are much more easily calculated. So in particular for effective field theory of inflation, you can calculate the disk of the graph to give you this expression. And what's so special about this expression is uh, if you use any other way, uh, uh, if you don't uh, don't want to go through the trouble of explicitly calculating this graph, the best you can do is say, okay, this is a K cube by scale in inver scale invariance. But when uh, by calculating the disk of the, uh, this graph, you learn that the cons uh, you actually have to have a constant, which can be expressed uh, in this form, and this C three just related to the interaction in the in, uh, in the theory. So by cutting rule, you learn more about uh, you, you, you have, uh, you learn more about the loop uh, diagram before actually having to calculate this loop itself. Now, I'm going to move on to talk about uh, locality. And um, so in inflation, bulk, uh, uh, bulk locality is um, 
difficult to understand, especially because we don't have things like a cluster decomposition theorem and so on. But we do have something called the manifesto cati. And the definition is as follows. Interaction must be built from the fields and the derivatives. So for example, everyone's uh, favorite scalar field theory is phi four. It's just built out of the field itself, right? It's just phi to power four. So this is a uh, manifestly local, which is good. This is also manifestly local because uh, you have phi, d phi square. So fields and the derivatives, so that's good. This is not manifestly local because you have this uh, inverse of the party in here. And um, so you have this actual operator, which makes it not manifestly local. Now, this is a uh, this notion of manifest locality is more restrictive than bulk locality, because um, you can imagine starting with a local theory, uh, theory and then do some field redefinition, which may introduce some inverse Laplacians. Nonetheless, if we work with this uh, uh, this class of theories, we can actually impose some very useful constraints. In particular, for masses and uh, scalar and graviton, we have something called the manifest locality test. So here, this K is again, just to remind you, this KC is just the norm of one of the external momentum, K. And if you take, uh, if uh, taking, uh, you take a wave function and then take the first uh, first derivative with respect to any KC and set KC to zero, you must get zero for both masses, scalar and graviton. This looks rather simple, but it turns out that this condition combined with uh, both symmetry and scale invariance is sufficient to completely fix the free, uh, the uh, psi free of the three point function of Y master scale to, to be this form here, poly three plus P. It's just a polynomial of a uh, degree three plus P in these variables. So these are all symmetric under exchange of K1, K2 and K3. CP is just some constant. And here this P, it's just a uh, uh, so uh, this just p is just related to usually related to the derivatives you have in your interaction. For example, phi dot cube corresponds to uh, this uh, this kind of interaction. If you calculate psi phi, you'll find that it corresponds to a p equals three term here. Now, this uh, you I mentioned that you can have the manifest locality test for graviton as well. So you can imagine extending this uh, uh, this whole story. To, uh, uh, to graviton as well. And the, uh, the main difference is that this constant here, we will now have extra tensor structures here. And it turns out that in the case of graviton, you can also use unitarity to give you some extra constraint on this constant. In particular, it tells you that there are only three allowed shades for parity or the uh, interactions for gravitons. And um, if you want to learn more about the details, you can go to uh, Angeran's talk on this. Okay, so now we can actually just come uh, Now I can talk about uh, combining locality and unitarity to construct a high order correlators. So the example I will use is constructing a psi four out of two psi three. So in the previous slide, I've already fixed uh, using locality, I fixed uh, psi three, right? Now you can use unitarity to tell us how uh, uh, to, to see how to glue them together to make a psi four. Uh, and in particular, unitarity tells you two things. So it tells you that they are, um, they are uh, they tell you where the pole of this uh, Feynman, di uh, Feynman diagram is. So it must be present in the EL, so which is K1 plus K2 plus S here, as it's just exchange and momentum. ER, K3 plus K4 plus S. And then there's also um, some over all the external momentum K, K1 plus K2 plus K3 plus K4. Unitarity tells us that these are all the poles, uh, these, uh, these are all the poles that you have. Now, utility also tells you that the disk of this diagram can be written in terms of uh, the disk of psi three squared, right? Because you, you just use the cutting rule to tell you, you cut this and then this gives you two diagrams like this, right? Now it turns out that just uh, the, this inform, uh, these two information is sufficient to fix the, um, uh, uh, sufficient to fix the residue of the uh, uh, of the po uh, of these poles in terms of size three, but you already fixed the form of a uh, form of size three by locality. So essentially, with this, there's more than enough to write down size four in the, uh, which, uh, which can be expressed in terms of this uh, form in Feynman diagram. Now you can imagine just playing this game with a um, higher and higher order three level diagram. So for example, you take this size four. 
and then you start with another side free. And then you just glue them together to get a uh, high order side five. And you just play this game over and over again. And you just get uh, more and more complicated, uh, complicated uh, wave function coefficient this way. OK. And so this is the end of the talk. I will just uh, use this slide again to reiterate what I have uh, I've introduced uh, here. Use locality to fix uh, your building blocks in this, uh, these simple graphs, which are your building blocks. Uh, in, in the example, I use a side free, but you can play this game actually for as uh, for con uh, for side four at content level, which can be expressed in this way, or some other uh, wave function coefficients, which can be expressed in this way. And then you can go between these uh, context uh, content diagrams with no internal legs, and then use them to construct high high and high order tree level diagrams with increasing number of internal legs. And the key to these uh, key to linking these two things is unitarity, which gives you uh, tells you how to cut them or how to glue them together. And that's all for me. Thank you.